Okay, let's get this like last two keynotes started. Uh, my name is Irina Overeem. I think many of you know who I am and like have met me, but there's always a couple new people at the CSDMS meetings. So I'm part of the integration facility and I'm responsible for education and knowledge transfer. Um, and that gives me the honor <laughs> to um, be responsible for the student awards. And um, our talk today um, by Jean-Arthur Olive is um, in because he won the Student Modeling Award. And this is something we do each year um, where we solicit graduate students to submit a, um, a, their best papers or theses uh, on modeling. We judge them for ingenuity of modeling, for the fact whether they coupled models, whether they like coupled between domains that weren't coupled before, um, whether they developed their code with best practices or not. And uh, this year we actually had quite a bit of good um, submissions and like people ticked a whole lot of those boxes. So to us that's kind of a measure of the success of seeing the students grow in sort of these new practices and new protocols that we are doing. Um, and it's a joy to see like how outstanding these contributions are. Another thing that, um, we, like the geodynamics group was highlighted this morning already because they grew so fast. They were also like really big in submitting um, contributions to the student modeler award so like that was another sort of a sign of the the excitement in that group of like forging into a new domain and like making new connections um, of all the contributions like most of them are now in international journals so um, but there still can only be one winner and so I'm very pleased to say that I'll be able to present the award to Jean Arthur Olive. Um, his submission to the um, CSDMS Student Modeler Award is the paper that he's going to be presenting to you. So, like, you'll like hear a lot more about what it is all about. But there was definitely novelty in this like new connection to the surface processes from the geodynamics community uh, that we really appreciated in his in his uh, submission. Um, Got them all over here. So, like, please, Jean Oli or Jean Latour. Thank you very much. We think this is a, a big honor. I think he can get a, a hand of you guys. <laughs> So the floor is um, for Jean Arthur. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for this award. Definitely um, attending this meeting last year made um, this work possible because it introduced us to dynamics to this community of um, surface dynamics modelers. And it's got us to think about new problems um, that uh, arise when we start to couple our very long-term lithosphere deformation models with uh, even simple formulations of surface processes that are um, active on the planet. So today I will present a uh, paper that we published last fall in GRL, where we investigate the uh, feedbacks between erosional and depositional processes on um, normal faults and the evolution of normal faults on long time scales. So I'd like to start with this um, quote which emphasizes the importance of surface processes as an upper boundary condition for geodynamic models. Um, and of course, this is a problem that has been looked at a lot, especially in collisional settings and in compressional settings, but hasn't, rel hasn't um, been looked at so much in extensional settings, especially not at the scale of individual normal fault systems. So just to give you a very brief overview of the context of this work, um, subaerial so normal faults can come in a variety of uh, shape. And the convenient way to think of it is a continuum based on their lifespan. And by that, I mean the maximum amount of offset they can accommodate before it becomes favorable to actually break a new fault elsewhere and abandon slip on the initial fault. So on one end of the spectrum, for instance, of, on uh, portions of the East African Rift, you'll see that extension in the upper part of the lithosphere 
um, proceeds by a succession of um, faulting events, growth of faults that um, accommodate about a kilometer of offset, and then are abandoned in favor of a new one. In other contexts, you can have faults that are active a little bit longer and that accommodate um, up to 10 of kilometers of offset. And on the very extreme end of the spectrum, you can even have normal faults that bring up lower crustal units to the surface and that are estimated to have accommodated more than 50 kilometers of offset. So the question we're asking today in um, the framework of coupling surface processes and tectonics is um, surface processes are important in redistributing the surficial loads that act on a fault. The question we ask is how can they affect fault lifespan? And this work uses a combination of numerical and simple analytical uh, modeling to address these questions. So the coupling was done um, within the framework of a code that um, we developed. It's called SISTER for uh, simple stokes with exotic rheologies. In this case, our exotic rheology is viscoelastoplastic flow. Um, and we focus on a typically 15 kilometer thick brittle layer that represents the continental upper crust that is subject to um, extension at a rate V. Its thickness will be varied. Um, we'll call that parameter H. And uh, it's actually sandwiched between a weak air layer and a weak lower crust layer, which I'm not going to show in any of those snapshots. Um, and uh, what we do in this is we initially see the weak zone that will rapidly take up the extension and form a fault. And we will monitor how this fault evolves and grows, how it bends the layers around it, and how it interacts um, with a very simplified formulation of surface processes. So the coupling of that model is achieved within our code. And our surface processes is a two-step process. First, after each tectonic time step, we have the current topography. So we look at what the local slopes are, and we erode locally each point on the surface um, using a scaling law where the erosion rate scales with slope to some power. Then we take this material, we erode it in each of the individual watersheds. We take this mass of material and we, re we redeposit it flat in each of the basins. So this is a very simplified um, treatment of erosion and sediment transport, but the, uh, it's one step above, say, a simple diffusion model. But it allows us to have a simple, single parameter that we can change, so we keep things simple. Um, in this case, it's the reference erosion rate that we calibrate on a 20 degree slope. So when I'll be talking about the erosion rate in all of those runs, keep in mind it is only the erosion rate for the 20 degree slopes. So all the other erosion rates are adjusted um, to all of the other slopes that can be here. So again, we stretch our brittle strong layer with an initially seeded fault, and we look at how it evolves with increasing offset H. And in particular, first we want to make sure that we capture the essential features of um, surface load redistribution and normal fault growth. So here are a few snapshots of topography. Uh, every single kilometer of increasing offset. And as you can see, you get the features you expect. You get um, uplift on the footwall side. You get subsidence on the hanging wall side. Erosion is active on the footwall reach and pushes it to retreat here uh, towards the back. And uh, you get sedimentation here uh, lying flat in the flexural basin that forms by subsidence. In addition, um, we observe pretty significant flexure of those blocks, and we observe significant rotation of the fault. So we believe we do a pretty good job at capturing the very basics of where the material is going and how the loads are being redistributed. Now the question we ask is, how does that feedback on the fault evolution on a longer time step, time scale? So to do this, I'm going to show you um, two movies that correspond to two runs in which we stretch a layer that is 15 kilometers thick. We stretch it at two millimeters per year. And the reference erosion um, applied on the top boundary condition, on the top surface, is either um, almost negligible compared to fault slip rates or is very important compared to fault slip rates. So in this first case, we have very slow erosion. And what you're going to see here is growth along the initial, the initial fault here, bending the layers around it. But very rapidly, you'll see a sequence of other faults that will be formed, and uh, things will get messy pretty quickly. Uh -huh. Here we go. So the initial fault here grows, um, and very rapidly is abandoned in favor of an antithetic fault. And then a third fault grows. And then very rapidly, you'll see another fault growing, and so on and so forth. We get exhumation of lower crustal units here, which are not shown. Um, but basically, the system proceeds by a succession of short-lived faults. Um, 
which uh, in the end, at the end of the snapshot, I've accommodated about 50 kilometers of stretching. Now by contrast, if we redo the exact same thing with a much faster erosion rate relative to the stretching rate, you will see that the initial fault here will stay active much longer. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the layers here are just meant to help you visualize the internal deformation in those blocks. They're not uh, materials of different, spro different properties. They're simply tracers to help you see where bending takes place um, and where most of the offset happens. So again, this is the case with faster erosion. You can see that the fault grows and bends the layers around it, but you can see that after 10, 15 kilometers of offset, it's still active until you break a new one. So by contrast with the initial simulation, where we abandoned the fault um, after three, four kilometers of offset, in this case, we've been able to keep this fault active much longer, about three, four times as long. And um, the next fault actually formed further away. It formed parallel to the initial fault. And you can see that there's a lot less um, topography that has been formed in this case. So just to summarize this, and of course, we ran a lot more of these simulations. This is a diagram showing a few snapshots um, after 22 kilometers of total extension. The um, reference erosion rate increases with, um, towards the bottom here. So this is the first video I showed you. Um, and you can see that it, in this run, it took three faults to accommodate about 20 kilometers of offset. Whereas if we increase the erosion rate um, significantly, then it only took two faults. And if we made the erosion rate so fast that it would actually level any topographic growth, um, we were able to keep this initial fault active essentially forever. And to, thin to synthesize all the runs that we've been doing, on this plot, I show the maximum offset that was accommodated by each of the in initial faults until the next one broke versus the erosion rate normalized by the slip rate. And this is done over a range of um, brittle layer thicknesses and over a range of stretching rates. And the interesting thing that you can see in all of the cases is that um, the system doesn't quite respond to an increase in the erosion rate until this erosion rate becomes comparable to the imposed um, stretching rate. But as soon as it does, you can either um, extend the fault lifespan all the way to infinity, which is what we've shown um, in the movie, for instance, or in the snapshots. And that's only in the 15 kilometer thick layer cases. But if you're looking at a thicker um, or, me or more mechanically strong layer, then you can actually only bring the maximum lifespan of the fault up to 15 kilometers. Just, just to reiterate that, um, if you apply very fast erosion on a relatively thin, brittle layer, you can keep the faults active forever. But if you do this on a thicker layer, you can only expand their lifespan up to about 15 kilometers. Now, to explain those results, those numerical results, um, with very basic physical arguments, we um, turn to a model considering the energy cost of growing a normal fault on long time scales. And we looked at the various contributions of um, topographic stress, bending stress, um, and so on and so forth. So, we think of it this way. If you want to keep a normal fault active on long time scales, you obviously need to supply extensional work um, in the far field. This energy gets partitioned into um, a portion that is dedicated to overcome the frictional resistance on the fault. But another part of that energy goes into bending the faulted layer. And you've seen there was significant internal deformation in the footwall and hanging wall. And the last part of that energy actually goes into sustaining the growth of topography. So what we did then is break down this energy cost. Actually, we formulated, we formulated it as a force balance. And we've separated the um, total force needed to keep the fault active into the friction term, the bending term, and the topographic term. And what I'm plotting here is the total tensional force needed to keep the fault slipping as a function of its increasing offset. And this is done for various layer thicknesses. So first, let's look at a 15 kilometer thick layer, which is your typical um, continental upper crust. You see these two curves here. This would be the total contribution of bending, friction, and um, topography all added together. And as you can see, pretty rapidly you reach this red threshold, which um, means that at some point it becomes um, easier to break a new fault than to keep slipping on the initial fault. So a fault that grows in this configuration will be abandoned pretty rapidly about three kilometers into its life, um, and then will die, and a new one will form. Now if you have very active surface processes that can level the topography, then uh, you can actually remove the contribution from the topographic uh, force. And this force increase actually happens a lot slower. 
and can stay below the threshold for breaking a new fault, which explains why when we leveled all topography, we sustained infinitely growing faults. Now, if you do this in a 25 kilometer thick layer, the bending terms and the topographic terms um, now become relatively bigger. So even if you can remove the uh, effect of topography, it's not enough to uh, take you to a regime where you could grow faults forever, but you can still significantly enhance their lifespan. And in a case where the faulted layer is very thin, then um, it doesn't really matter anyway because those two contributions are relatively small and you can keep fault active for a, a pretty long time. Another interesting thing that this brings up is the mode of formation of the next fault. And as you can see in the two runs I've shown you, there were two regimes. The first one where um, we had a lot of topography buildup, so this is a slow erosion case. And in those cases, the next fault tended to form really close to the initial fault, actually in an antithetic configuration. But when we had strong erosion and not a lot of um, topography, then the faults, the next fault tended to form about one flexural wavelength away from the initial one, suggesting that in this regime, the bending is actually the dominant process and the length, the length scales are set by um, flexure processes. Whereas um, in this end number, it's really the topography and the size of the relief that you can create that set the uh, length scales of interest. So this work has several implications for rift dynamics when looking at the scale of normal faults. And we're now in the process of trying to confront this to uh, data. Um, what we've done here is construct a regime diagram based on our simulation and um, try to plot different rift settings on it. So the x-axis represents the intensity of surface processes, or rather their efficiency at redistributing stress or leveling the topographic effect. And the y-axis would be a mechanical parameter, so the simplest one to think about is the uh, thickness of the brittle layer. But then in that simple framework, you can start thinking of where different um, regions would plot, and you can start thinking about what this would predict in terms of the characteristic modes of faulting you would get there. Would you get a lot of short-lived faults, or would you get a few very long-lived faults? So places like um, the East African Rift, where the lithosphere is strong, would plot on this end of the spectrum. Places like the Western US um, could actually be in an interesting region where um, you could have a lot of sensitivity to, um, to, that top, um, to that surface process feedback. And within a single region, if you actually reach elevations where you could have the uh, onset of active glacial processes, then it's possible that locally you can get out of your reference box and um, start having interest in feedbacks. So the future directions with these uh, models is to make them meet data and uh, improve them in several ways. We're looking into um, better parameterizing sediment deposition to have a better uh, formulation of the load redistribution. And uh, the next thing that I'm looking at is the competition between the top-down control and the um, bottom-up control, so from lower crustal flow versus the control of the upper boundary condition on the modes of faulting and the propagation of deformation in an active rift. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. I, one of the questions I have, though, is did you solve for the thermal solution, which would allow this to, of course, thin with time and be an additional feedback to what you're talking about? So yes, we do um, solve for thermal evolution, but we assume the very efficient heat extraction. So that keeps our uh, bottom boundary condition essentially flat. But that is one of the aspects I want to explore when I mean the bottom-up control, because that also influences the degree of mechanical coupling with the lower crust. So that's it's in our plans. Thank you.